Welcome to Lore Citizen, a podcast dedicated to all things Star Citizen lore. If you enjoy this, make sure that you like, subscribe, and follow all of our social medias. Without further ado, let's get started. Welcome back to Lore Citizen and our new fancy, we've got a new fancy logo with uh, with the Lore Citizen podcast. And uh, this is going to also end up being on merch. So this is, I guess, this is the announcement that we're going to have a merch drop in the next month. So take a look for your hoodies and t-shirts and baby onesies and all those sorts of things if you want to get them. Um, and today we've got another uh, special guest. He, he He's been here before. But he's joining us again after all of this time. And if you're watching this, uh, if you want early access and exclusive access to the video, you can you can join the Patreon because you can see myself and and Tree here as well. Um, to be able to see our little photos, our little things, just raw, uncut footage, which you will not see on the YouTube video, just on the uh, the, the the Patreon. So, Tree, who are you? What do you do in Star Citizen? Where can they find you? Hey everyone, I'm Tree0311 or Tree0311 is what it actually looks like. Um, you can find me on YouTube, you know, at Tree0311, as well as on Twitch by the same name. And then Twitter, uh, it's Tree0311-SC. Um, I host a, a couple of podcasts with my podcast partners. The Pathfinders is with Nazareth, and we do deep dives into basically the development of Star Citizen and its different mechanics and you know everything from ships to um, gameplay mechanics. Uh, or, or tools used by the dev teams. We we do deep dives into those things. We usually do a couple episodes a month. Um, and then I also do armchair admirals and generals with Night Cobb and Atira Kel, who have also been on Captain's Table. And uh, we are all members of the military, and we uh, basically talk about different aspects of Star Citizen from our points of view, you know, colored by our experiences within the military. And so we have a lot of fun with that. We usually, we're, we've got three episodes now and we're going to do our fourth one here in a couple of weeks, starting in January. We're on a, a hiatus, just like a CIG is for the winter. Um, and in real life, and that's part of the impetus for this episode and then the previous Lore Citizen episode I did with Paul, um, I'm a former infantry Marine with uh, multiple combat deployments to Iraq in the early mid 2000s. Um, and I'm a career um, civilian uh, paramedic and flight paramedic, um, and I'm now actually I'm also have been a army flight paramedic uh, with the Army National Guard and a medevac unit. Um, so I've been doing all of that for um, going on the better part of two decades. Uh, so that's uh, uh, the two things that really color my different interests in Star Citizen is Marines and dropships and and all that stuff. Uh, the UE Marines, as well as the medical gameplay and the, the aspects of search and rescue in Star Citizen. Thanks. Yeah, I was going to say, I was going to say, um, uh, we're going to, we're talking about uh, the medical. The one thing we don't have is the equivalent of the VA, thankfully. Uh, it, it, it star, star Citizen <laughs> yeah. can't be, it can't be so, dis, uh, um, so, uh, uh, um, uh, dystopian dystopian uh, because <laughs> because there's no there's no va thank god uh <laughs> yeah we're 90 percent we're 90 percent there we just need the the vea the the ue military is equivalent of the va and yeah we'll be fine yeah perfect perfect post-apocalyptic dystopian future uh <laughs> But uh, we're as we're going to talk, we're going to be talking about medical, medical gameplay, a little, uh, but the, the lore behind the medical stuff, uh, and you'll find out that'll everything that is in game, as as you've probably already found out if you've been listening to the Lord Citizen podcast, or watching any lore stuff, everything has lore, and all of the reasons and the all of the the mechanics that we've had since medical got kind of reintroduced or updated last year. They updated a ton of stuff around regeneration, around healing, and we also have some older stuff. So note that this is the stuff we're going to talk about today is a mixture of stuff that's from like 2014, 2015 and stuff that was last year. So most of it meshes, but some of it is going to be things we're going to pull like, oh, that makes sense. And that makes sense. That makes sense. So uh, with that being said, let's start off with a discussion on Biotic Core. Go ahead, Tree. Yeah, so um, Bioticor is a really interesting organization, um, and they're interesting because we have a, a, a number of different things from the from them. Like you said, we're, we're pulling things together, and we have the original portfolio from Bioticor that talks about them. 
But then we have several other mentions of them that CIG, the, the narrative team, have used in order to incorporate them into the the other aspects of medical uh, medicine in, in in game, as well as the basically just um, how health and healthcare work in the universe of Star Citizen. Um, and when we were talking about the 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 dystopianness of Star Citizen, um, Bioticor figures into that pretty well with uh, how they've got their fingers into different aspects of, of medicine and healthcare. Um, so Bioticor is one of the major manufacturers when it comes to um, medical and surgical devices within the Star Citizen universe. Um, and you know, there's a couple other different companies, but you know, the, the one we have the most information on, and the, one of the most references is Bioticor. And Bioticor got their start um, like so many other scientific related uh, corporations, they got their start in a university. Um, and for them, their university start uh, was actually on uh, Retor, which is uh, the one of the planets in the system of Retor where all the um, so many universities are actually uh, located. There's also universities, you know, back on Earth and in different other systems on Terra and what have you. But a lot of scientific advancement comes out of the universities in the Redder system. And so um, Bioticor is actually a really recent uh, corporation. The, their history is only a couple decades old. They're, um, and, and I think that kind of speaks to the idea of the UEE is still, um, we're still recovering. The UEE is still recovering from the, 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 the overbearing weight of the measures and how mm the way the measures ran things was just uh, really, it, 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 it kind of makes me think about how um, the USSR and the Soviets were as far as stifling uh, advancement. Yeah. I was going to, I was going to say the one thing that is pretty, pretty obvious is uh, there's a lot of, I always talk about the, the cargo crisis. Whenever I talk about the rise of the new ship manufacturers, pretty much all of the new ship manufacturers in uh, pretty much all the manufacturer ship manufacturers that exist today in the, in the UAE are new. The only exception are like a handful. Argo, RSI, and Aegis are pretty much the old, the ones that are exception. I think Kruger kind of, because they were around beforehand and uh, before that. But, you know, Misk, Drake, uh, Anvil, uh, Crusader, all of these, these, uh, Grey Cat, well, okay, Grey Cat was around a little bit before there. But those those companies all came out because of the measures. Because when the measures fell, everyone who's connected to them either ran for the hills, was killed, or arrested. So that caused a bunch of these companies, which if you ever study anything like like despotic dictatorships, everyone is connected to the government when those kinds of things <laughs> happen. So a lot of those companies went down. And it's pretty obvious that especially during the measure era, there was some pretty messed up medical experiments and medical treatments that were like, like experimentation. So a lot of those companies that would be responsible for healthcare disappeared organizations or groups disappeared. And so we see, we see this kind of like struggling aspect of, of just getting basic medical ass assistance to places that are not soul or Terra seems to be a struggle. So yeah, no, it's a, it's a it's an overarching theme that um, I, I always find. I hate to say entertaining, but it is you know it, it's a, it's a very dystopian universe. Yeah, yeah, it's entertainment, and <laughs> you know, in in that the you know this is the the universe that uh, they've created for a Star Citizen, and for hundreds of years, um, you know, basically the 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 government stifled everything because it wasn't necessary. We're like, nope, we uh, these are our priorities, and mm -hmm. You know, the advancement of medicine, you know, really wasn't that, that that big of a deal to them. Does it kill aliens? No. Throw it away. <laughs> Pretty <Yeah>. much. <laughs> Not interested. Next. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so the the it seems, you know, from the, the various articles that we're going to talk about, it seems like there's a lot of um a lot of demand for for significant improvements in what we what we had during the Meser area, you know, all the way through from the beginning to the end of the Meser area, there's a lot of room for improvement that just wasn't invested in. They're, 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 the people that um, wanted to do this work didn't have the, the funding, didn't have the research, they're retasked to other things. Um, and so now all of a sudden you have this weight lifted on the scientific community and they're like, hey, we want to do this. And, you know, all these different universities and, you know, even the UEE are like, oh, that sounds great. Yeah, here's some, here's some money. Go ahead and do it. And so in 2912, 
um, on the uh, uh, on Retor, uh, these two scientists were at the Scaliger uh, School of Medicine, and um, they they're in this research laboratory, which is apparently super famous for um, uh, being the impetus of a whole bunch of scientific advancements. Um, but it's also super famous for just basically having these over overzealous uh, uh, contamination system that that detects contamination and basically locks the whole place down. And so um, students just call it decon or call it the decon lab because they free so frequently get uh, stuck in there and they'll be stuck in there for hours or days waiting for the decontamination process to to be done. And so. Um, the two founders of Biotacor, Ted Santo or Santos, uh, it's spelled t differently, uh, and Dio Nicholas um, were uh, stuck in this lab during a lockdown in 2912. And Santos was new to the university. And so this is, you know, this is his first time. He's a new guy. And so he's sort of panicking, you know, maybe having a little bit of claustrophobia in this lab while they're stuck. And in order to calm him down, uh, Dio Nicholas decided, says, hey, you know, tell me about your research. Tell me what you're doing. And they, re they, they um, I'm not going to go deep into their research, but they realize after they've been talking for a few hours that their two research projects are actually connected um, inadvertently. And like, oh my gosh, we, we have to combine our efforts. Um, and their efforts were actually very, you know, uh, very uh, of significant interest to the UEE and particularly the UEE military. Um, and so when they finally got out of lockdown, they combined the research efforts. And they published a paper in the Retor Journal of Medicine that uh, approved a link between what's called genetic gravitational compression um, that occurs in quantum uh, during quantum travel. And they proved a link between that and the increased fatality rates um, for transporting emergency patients who are in surgery, you know, transporting them while in quantum. So apparently, prior to proving out this link, um, there's not only a, a disease that uh, UE Navy starmen, you know, who with long service records, who obviously spent a lot of time in quantum, were very uh, had very high rates of this neurological disorder um, that was uh, potentially linked to you know being stuck in quantum travel and the effects of quantum travel on the human body, as Tarian well as disease? is that what it's called? Yeah, Tar Targan or Targian? I forget yeah. how it's pronounced. It's it's T A R G I O N. Um, so uh, I know I know that mm -hmm. one links. Yeah. Yeah, and so they um, they they basically published a link that says, "Hey, we're doing surgery on these emergency patients, you know, during you know who are, you know, whether it's a civilian or military search and rescue, you, we find them, they're injured, and we're trying to get them back to the hospital as soon as possible. We're also doing surgery on them during quantum travel in order to try and save their lives." And they found that the doing surgery on these patients during quantum travel um, subjected them to this. Uh, these effects that was affecting UE Navy starmen um, from being in quantum travel. And so uh, the research changed search and rescue protocols uh, immediately. Um, and it doesn't overtly say this, but I think what it, what it uh, led to is saying, hey, um, don't go in and do surgery on these patients. Don't replace organs or limbs during quantum travel, but instead do what you need to do to stabilize them. We'll do surgery on them once you get them to the hospital. Um, and that uh, led to a, a significant reduction in the mortality of these patients who were being um, transported uh, after having significant injuries, you know, being transported in emergent fashion back to the hospital. And so this made a huge difference in mortality. Um, and it's basically a, a landmark paper when it when it comes to these sorts of things. Uh, and it's it's really interesting to me because, Paul, you've mentioned it multiple times when we've talked a bit before about how you know, the narrative team, when they go in to sort of set the foundation for a, a theme within Star Citizen, they do their homework. They don't just hand wave you and make stuff up. And when it comes to this, they've they've done their research. Um, my background is in search and rescue, you know, emergency medicine, critical care transport. That's all that I do. And so I, I read I I read a ton of research papers and they basically have gone and found a theme to adopt from a real world thing in order to incorporate it into to the Star Citizen universe. Um, and so the when this re research paper was published, uh, essentially when things like this happen, you get a whole bunch of press and attention to where they were published out of, you know, whatever research institute or, or, or group uh, publishes it, you know, they get a lot of attention. A lot of times they'll get funding from different corporations or, or schools that say, hey, we want you to come work for us. We want you to, to, to work for us and develop the next advancement. 
And so this uh, Scaliger School of Medicine um, created a, uh, a a brand new um, research lab, um, you know, institute, whatever you want to call it, for these two, you know, uh, the two authors of this paper, the two founders of Biotacore. And by creating that lab, you know, they essentially founded Biotacore out of that lab. And um, m- uh, going on from their research paper, they basically created a, a software suite um, that paired with uh, surgical robots that were already being used that allowed those robots to compensate for these effects of quantum travel that was leading to high rates of mortality for emergency patients um, and uh, further advance what they're doing. So instead of saying, okay, you know, here's the new search and rescue protocol, we're not going to do these surgeries while in quantum travel, you're, you're going to need to do what you can to stabilize, you know, basically, um, keep the clock from running down, slow the clock as much as possible, but we still have to do the surgery once you get the patient to the hospital. Well, now they made it so, okay, instead of having to wait um, until you get to the hospital, consume all those resources, we have retuned these robots in order to be able to, uh, the, the surgical assist robots, in order to be able to compensate for these effects so that way we can still provide this early surgery. Um, it's sort of, it, it's, to me, it sounds a lot like what we call damage control surgery um, in, in the military and the civilian sector for trauma, um, where you're just going in and you're, you're stopping bleeding, you're, you're uh, doing things in order to, you know, stop the clock. So that way, the you know, additional surgeries can, you know, the patient survives until they can get to this higher level surgery, su- surgical suite. And so that's what it sounds like. They've basically made it so that way these robots with their new software, they compensate for the effects of quantum travel, and now they can save even more patients, patients who otherwise might have died by having to wait for surgery. Um, and that was their biggest, it, it, their, their first uh, commercial product. Um, and it's interesting because it ties into the little bit of information we have from the um, Apollo comlink um, and how vital the use of the Apollo, the, the Apollo is a two century old ship. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not a new ship. And it ties into what they talked about in the Apollo about how um, uh, paramedics and uh, civilian EMS and search and rescue is still a very prominent thing within the Star Citizen universe. So um, with Biotacore and the, the the two founders, the this um, when they released that first commercial product, that software suite, it was universally adopted across the UE. Everybody's like, this is amazing. We have to have this on our on our Apollos and whatever else. And uh, basically, I made up a ton of money. And they reinvested all the profits into further research. And that sort of like set the tone for Biotacor, um, how, you know, when, whenever there's something that, you know, whenever there's a need, Biotacor is really already, are, they're already researching it. They're already working on it. It's just, a, you know, almost a, a matter of time, you know, time and funding because they, re, they basically reinvest all their profits into additional research. And I got I to gotta add this in there because I always love this story. Um... This is this is also where Drake comes in because Drake <laughs> and Biotacore apparently have a very good working relationship. Um, the the Cutlass Red is an interesting one, uh, and I'll talk. I can I tie into this one? I, I didn't want to. I didn't think about bringing Cutlass Red, but the Cutlass Red is the ambulance of the universe of Star Citizen. Uh, everything from civilian infrastructure to some military infrastructure is based around Cutlass Reds, so uh, they're designed to be, and they they were the default because. They were some of the first adopters of the Biotic Corp Autodoc, the, the software suite that, that's used. So when you open up a Cutlass Red and you see those tier three medical beds, those are Autodocs. Those are medical beds that use Autodoc, the Autodoc uh, software and such. Uh, so when you're looking through the little little screens and you're clicking that, if you look at the screen, the top left or top, the top or bottom right or something like that, I think it says Biotic Corp on the screen because that's their, that is their their technology. So it's already in the game. You kind of interact with it and the whole, like the light thing, all that kind of stuff. Um, but the story goes that um, the governor of Berea had an assassination attempt on him. And because he, he, uh, but he was, they just happened to be a cutlass red nearby when the assassination attempt happened. And so he was hurried to the cutlass red and put into the Cutlass Red to stabilize him, and it was that stabilization that saved his life. And that was a huge, like, promoter that not only was, you know, it good for Drake, it was great for Biotacore because it proved that their software was not only theoretical, but it worked in the field and had a high-profile case. So I always like that story because 
I'm a, I'm a Magnus boy at heart, so I, I love those sorts of little. Magnus. I don't know who tried to kill the, the the governor though. That's that's another question. It's like what what's going on in Magnus exactly. where there's a, there's an assassination attempt on the governor. <laughs> I actually meant to ask you about that because that, this is the only mention of that assassination attempt is in the the profile for or the portfolio for Bodicor, and it's like. Paul, what's going on in your home planet? Uh, did uh, you vote for this guy? Is he not a good dude? <laughs> well, Newcastle is actually, um, I think, I remember one of the cities is locked down. You can't access it yeah. anymore. Because there was a terrorist attack on it. So mm -hmm. there's there's something going on. There's some sort of rebellion movement in, in Berea that's going on that's attacking people. So that's a, but it's not never mentioned anywhere else. So it's a very, yeah. very kind of like, I do wonder what's going on in 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 Berea. In yeah, we've system. got we've got two very subtle mentions of the unrest on Berea that they're going to have to flesh out a lot. But yeah, if somebody's trying to blow up the governor's council, not just yeah. the governor, but the governor's the governor's council. council. Like the, yeah, you know all the because that's how effectively it works, there's like the, the government. It's effectively the planetary mm -hmm. government. So you yeah, know. and somebody tried to take the whole council out, and you know nearly nearly did it. You know this. Um, because yeah, Bioticor, they went on from developing the software for the tools that were already available to actually manufacturing, you know, the, their own uh, surgical robots, surgical assist, you know. And when they say surgical robots, it's and this is this goes on to the theme that uh, in the other gameplay documents um, that they've laid out, where these are interactive things. It isn't a set and a forget thing. It's a it, kind of like what we have now. They're surgical assist robots. They're just more advanced than what we have now. And so, you know, you have to, you still have to tell the robot what to do. It has, it has some autonomy, but it isn't fully autonomous. But when, you know, when you have a, a robot, you know, a surgical assist robot, you know, on the back of a Cutlass Red ambulance that can basically, you know, on its own with very little, you know, interaction from basically, an, you know, a someone, you know, the, it basically, it sets the tone for the more skill you have with the, you know, um, and the more capabilities of the auto doc med beds that you have, they, they tie into each other. And so you can have very limited skill and put somebody in this auto doc bed and it'll scan them, tell them, you know, here are the sort of, you know, there's the basics of the injuries um, here, you know, here are the options that you have um, press yes to initiate. And that's basically what happened is they got the the this uh, the victims of this governor's council explosion or bombing attack to an, uh, a cutlass red, and they were able to get them into the auto dock beds and you know stabilizing them to the point where they didn't die. You know, stabilize them to the point where hey, you know, you're gonna make it. We just need to get you to the hospital. You're gonna you know, hang in there, um, essentially. And that's the 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 overall theme um, from the the auto docks and the medical beds is that based off of the level of capability and, and the resources you you can provide to them um that's what you know you're you're capable of doing but that that, that was a, a a huge moment because biotacore had been manufacturing these auto docs with their surgical suites um but they were you know the the initial auto doc is um very limited in its capabilities compared to the more advanced um uh surgical assist robots that were made by their other um uh, by their competitors, but the the big difference is that you could put an auto dock in a cutlass red. You mm. can put you know the the higher level ones and other you know, other level of a little ships. They didn't need to be in a giant surgical suite in a hospital because they were so reliable. You know they were uh, it's a very robust system that you know with especially the software that they developed, they could withstand the rigors of quantum you know and space flight and still get the job done. So they're perfect for, you know, search and rescue, perfect for EMS, perfect for the military's needs um, in order to make it so that way, you know, if you can get to the patient, you can probably keep them alive. You know, you can probably prevent them from dying, you know, uh, and, and uh, you know, buy them more time, extend the clock with these devices to get them to the ultimate level of care that they need. Um, but they, on top of the auto dock, they... Um, uh, Bioticor also, you know, it took it, you know, made a lot of advancements um, in, in the sector of medical scanners. And I think that's one thing that is really interesting. It's part of a, a two part thing where not only is Bio, you know, Bioticor is um, really into the software and also, you know, the, the medical devices, you know, the surgical assist robots that help save lives, but they also are into the diagnostic sector where they create medical scanners in order to give you the most information 
uh, available in order to you know really um, I guess you'd say uh, amplify the effectiveness of, of things like the auto doc because you know, the more information you have you know the more detailed information you have the um, better the better diagnosis you can make and that in, the it's really subtle information but from a medical you know me a medical practitioner you know the the uh, the more I guess you'd say specific, the diagnostic information I have, the better I can be about providing the right treatment. And that factors into the medical gameplay we have with your blood drug level um, and recovery times that they've talked about and how things will work. And by having these medical scanners and by using an auto doc and really taking the information available to you and using it, you can basically fine tune your care in order to provide the most appropriate care without, you know, overdosing a patient without um, causing more injury. And so it really fits in really well. But it's interesting because they talk about how they developed this new line of medical scanners that improve scanning techniques and allowed, uh, you know, humans and then also surgical assist robots to be more accurate. Um, but it's really the only mention of the Vitalis Pro Metascan, um, which it has been, again, uh, I, you wouldn't say universally adopted, but it's it's like saying you know they invented the next generation of the 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 CAT scan, the CT scanner, mm -hmm. um, that gave them a whole lot more information, and they've become almost ubiquitous you know within the healthcare community. And uh, the medical scanners really tie into what's available for imprinting or generation. But we'll get into that later. But because these scanners, like the Autodoc, are so robust and portable, it makes it so it, it really takes it's a, like a, a I hate to say quantum, but it's a quantum leap in what's available in the field. And that's part of why the this uh, portfolio for Biotacore is really ties in well with what they said in the Q&A and the Endeavor, uh, for the Endeavor Q&A, about how important and vital the medical gameplay and that profession is in Star Citizen, because they've set the tone with these devices the um, the auto dock and the Vitalis scanner of enabling players to go out and treat, um, you know, stabilize and transport, you know, injured players and other NPCs um, out in the field. It's it's a very it's it's an integral part of the Star Citizen universe, just like it is today. You know, and if you're not familiar with it, you don't recognize that it's there, but it's there. You know, not mm -hmm. only in the first world, but in the third world. Uh, um, Vitalis may actually be the, the the thing that's used on the med pens too, or the med gun that's made by Cure Life. Yeah, it seems to be mm -hmm. the same same technology where you can tell you exactly what's hurt, you know, that kind of thing. And funny, this is also another interesting thing. There is no equivalent to HIPAA in the uh, in the Star Citizen universe, which I found mm -hmm. very funny. For those who don't know who what HIPAA is, in the United States, there's a law that that basically says you cannot share medical information without the permission of uh, the person who's there and like the doctor and, and, and just, it's, it's a big long Yeah, process. you have to have consent. Consent for it. And I've, I've, I've had to go through HIPAA rules, this stuff and, uh, and uh, uh, PIPA, which is a similar thing for like education and stuff like that. There's all a bunch of laws about privacies and, and dealing with like what, who, what information can and can't be accessed by which individuals. Um, because Story of my life. <laughs> <laughs> the, every patient, uh, every time. Yeah. <laughs> Sign here, please. Uh, but the Vitalis has actually got some controversy because it can scan everything. It can apparently can, can d detail all the parts of your body in incredible detail down to the flaws. So, um, there's been people like, this is an incredible breach of privacy. If you can just scan anyone with these things. And since they're handheld and portable, you can use them anywhere. So someone could, mm -hmm use it for nefarious purposes possibly so it's been a been a debate that's been going on so it'll be interesting to see if they flesh that out even more because with the vitalis you not only do you have the uh, the portable handheld um device and i i want to say that is manufactured by cure life yeah but the scanner portion is probably it's one of those things where okay Cure Life manufactures the device but it's using a vitalis you know scanner from scanner. biotacore it's got to be yeah yeah, it, it's um, this is part the part where we're we're kind of we're putting the pieces together because there's no mention filling in of the what blanks the, w w of what it is, but it uses the same kind of like highlight stuff, and it, it's very similar to the technology in the auto dock because when you get in the auto dock and it says, "Hey, mm -hmm. this is what's problem is this is what the problem is." That's the Vitalis that you're using when it's when it's like you know 
your leg has a tier three injury. You have strained your leg. That's that's the Vitalis medical scanner. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah. Um, um, I was going to also say the other th- cool thing, which is uh, interesting, if we pull these pieces together as well, the uh, paramed device that's used by Cure Life uses nanites. So when you see the beam, the infamous beam of healthcare, the, the, the beaming health. What you're actually seeing is effectively um, a tractor beam, which is shooting uh, tiny robots into your body to 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 heal you. So a lot of the healing process is actually done through um, miniature miniaturization, ultra miniaturization. So I wonder if that's what we see with the auto docs as well. It's something something that maybe Biotacorp uh, revolutionized. I'd like to know more about that because. We know that there's no like arms doing complex surgery on you right now, and we may see that in the future. But the scan that comes through is very similar to the, the you know the the beams on the on the paramed devices. So possibly. that's one thing they really need to flesh out is mm-hmm. because when the you know the with the paramed device and then the med pens, you know the paramed device uses um, you know the the same you know, provides the same medication that the med pens do. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's okay. Where where do the two, you know, um, intersect? You mm-hmm. know, as far as providing medication and then providing healing, and how do the med beds work? And I think there's a a lot of it is just limited by the where we are with the gameplay aspects of it, um, because I also haven't spoken about it too much in the lore about how all that works. And mm-hmm. so we can only just sort of imply based off of what limited information we have, you know, especially because yeah. you know it. They they do talk about you know how you're still administering medications you know the you have to uh, put um, supplies into the med beds you know, uh, in order for them to function and so it's it's gonna be really interesting how they further flesh that out and what are the lore we get with it that's why I'm really hoping we get a, a portfolio on a cure life because that's really the the sort of third arm um, to this puzzle between biotic or cure life and then the actual hospitals and healthcare systems that you you read you know we'll be talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, the and so Biotacore, you know, has had great success with things like the Vitalis uh, Metascan, a uh, Vitalis Pro Metascan, the Autodocs, their different softwares that they use, um, but they haven't had overwhelming success, just like with anything else in science and medicine. Occasionally, you'll you'll run into hiccups, um, and I wonder if this is one of those things where they will use it as a lore explanation for events that can happen in game, um, or or you know, almost like a probability volume of something not working, you know, having malfunctions. Mm. Because they talk about how um, Biotacor made what's called the Pure Life system. And it's basically like a, a decon system. So that way, when you come on to a station or you arrive at a landing zone, um, it, it's it's a big thing with international travel. You know, we ask you, you know, have you been sick? Have you have been ill? You know, in order to prevent the spread of disease. And there's been multiple mentions in the lore of outbreaks of this or that disease, you know, occurring on a station or at a landing zone after somebody arrived from far off. And so Biotacore tried to fill this need where you walk through this scanner, like you see, um, it, it wouldn't just be, you know, hey, we're looking for weapons as you're coming through customs or, or other legal things. We're also scanning you for pathogens, for diseases. And um, so they, they, incorporated this thing and it, it went to the mass market and it turned out that this scanner um, was designed to scan for diseases and then eradicate them sort of like in star trek where it scans you you know you uh, coming for you know you, you return from an away mission on the surface and it scans you and eliminates any pathogens well um unfortunately it, it was overly sensitive uh, kind of like antibiotics are now where if you take antibiotics it'll mess with the bacteria in your stomach in your digestive tract and that's why you get an upset stomach. You'll sometimes have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Well, this was the scanning device. Um, the, the Pure Life system was scanning and was saying, oh, okay, well, we found these bacteria, these pathogens. It could be um, a problem. And it was eliminating the ones that were a problem, but also the ones you need to survive. And so people were getting really sick when it was removing these helpful microbes. And so they recalled the device. I'm like, okay, uh, this isn't ready for, uh, for you know, real-time use. Um, you know, back to the drawing board. But even even after that, with their successes, um, yeah, Biotacore is still a uh, a very 
well thought of um, company in in the UEE, um, especially by how they reacted to this you know this failure of one of your one of the, your devices. Um, and the last bit of information we had by Autocore, and this is a really good transition into the regeneration part that Paul's going to talk about, um, is after they invested a lot, they, they continued on that theme of reinvesting their profits into, into more scientific and medical advancements. Um, and their uh, Biotocore's next big breakthrough was this uh, thing called Project Calliope, Calliope. I'm not sure how to say it. I think it's Calliope because um, I always say Calliope, yeah. and then the, the comment section is always like, "Paul, oh, it's actually a Greek <laughs> word," and it's like, "Yes, I know, but I'm 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 American, and I'm gonna say Cal- Cal- uh, Calliope because that's what it sounds like." No, it's it's Calliope. It's one of the one of the names. <laughs> so it sounds that's what it sounds like to me. It sounds um, like to me. <laughs> but it uh, Project Calliope is taking what they've built with the Vitalis Pro medical scanner and the um, the Autodoc and taking it, you know, at that, that sort of next quantum leap even further because it's a full-body diagnostic and surgical system that is um, it really tied uh, towards the um, cosmetic and reconstructive surgery. So that way you could have, you know, not only can we replace your organs, replace your limbs, um, but we can, you know, they also wanted to be able to, uh, restore you to how you were before, you know, um, so that way you wouldn't have scars, you know, you wouldn't have, uh, the, these defects or, um, it, basically it's a way to explain how your, your character is able to return to normal because there's a system that was really developed more, you know, for the military who has had these horrific injuries from, you know, combat in, in the void or, or, and with the Vanduul. Um, as well as, uh, it was really insp- also inspired by, uh, the, this chief medical engineer for Biotacor who is, uh, horrifically burned in a ship accident. And so she's like, okay, how do we not only, um, bring you back to function with replacement organs and limbs, but also restore your appearance, you know, as well as other things in order to really, you know, bring you back to where you were before, if not better than before. And, um, so it, 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 it's, uh, w- with bringing this to market, it's allowed for, uh, patients to have these massive, uh, changes to their body in order to restore them to normal or, uh, provide cosmetic changes. You know, that's where the real money is, um, mm-hmm. for the, the lifestyles and the rich and famous. Um, and it's still, uh, when this was written, it was still in early trials with the military with a lot of really impressive results. Um, but it was able to bring these Navy starmen and Marines and soldiers, you know, back to normal, um, or, or, or even better than before. You know, if you had this, Oh, I've always had this, uh, I have an old injury and, you know, I, I, you know, or I lost an arm and everything, but it's always had this, you know, a, you know, twinge in my shoulder or something. Well, now they can, you know, completely restore you using this, um, this system, you know, from project Calliope. Um, it's described as being absolutely life-changing for the the people that have benefited from it. Um, and like with, you know, regeneration, you know, the, you know, the, they say that the full social and cultural effects of having the ability to not only completely alter your appearance uh, on top of being able to return you completely back to normal, they almost, you know, not quite reverse the effects of aging, but reverse the effects of injury and illness, you know, to bring you completely back to where you were before. Um, it's really transformed uh, the universe of Star Citizen since its development. Yeah, and it's it's only starting to make its way into the civilian market, but to kind of tie mm-hmm. this into the games, in the future, the idea is, is that you'll be able to go to like a medical center, so like a Brentwood Medical Center, and you'll be able to change how your character looks. So you'll be able to go into one of these one of these autodocs or a separate system, we don't know yet, yet and you'll be able to change your character c- customization based off of your own desires at any time for a price, but you know, for a price. And that's the, you're still, still going to pay for it in game, but you know, mm-hmm. that's the, and that's kind of the interesting part where we're sort of tying it together because, because this is new technology and it's not widely available. It's one of those things like this is going to be expensive. And if you don't have the the money, you don't have the right insurance, 
you don't go to the the right hospital in game to have this done it's not going to be a, you know might not be available to you mm-hmm. um you know it's just like with the um yeah you if if you not going to a, the, the right facility you know they'll, they'll be able to offer the services that say okay well you know, sorry this leg is you know this leg is toast and um, we don't have the the services and the the equipment to grow you a new leg and reattach that new leg to you, but we can put this bionic one on, you know, mm-hmm. and you know uh, it, it should, you know, that there's a a five percent chance that your body will reject it, you know, or, or something, or it won't function as appropriately. But ninety percent of the time, you know, sixty, you know, sixty percent of the time, it works every time, every time, you know, because this yeah. is. Because this is, you know, New Junction, you know, the, the Empire Health Services on New Junction and, and not Brentworth Care Center on Microtech. Yeah. Yeah. You know. um, and and uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but uh, but I'll, I'll I'll go into regeneration and we'll kind of go talk about the day to day stuff, because I personally think that Pop Project um, um, Calliope uh, or Calliope is the impetus for what we know today as regen serum. So. Uh, because the way that the that Project Calliope is designed, it, it effectively completely rewrites or like reshapes your bone structure. So it'll like effectively um, do what surgeons do now to do things like like chin or nose or like like uh, like different surgeries you can do to kind of like sh- shave down your your neckline or your your uh you know other other cosmetic surgeries to change your appearance it can do this through more biological methods through through chemical methods rather than through surgery um and so it's much faster it's more outpatient and that kind of thing which again points me directly to regen serum but to do that let's talk a little bit about uh the the folly of a Dr. Ibrahim. So <laughs> also fairly new, uh, literally, I think the same year as when it was founded a year after. No, no. Um, two years before the creation of the Vitalis. So it's around the same time. We have a man by the name of uh, Dr. Aka Ibrahim. So Dr. Ib- uh, Dr. Ibrahim had been, uh, his entire life, he was dedicated to trying to restore patients who had suffered um, traumatic brain injuries, traumatic hand injuries, and other sorts of massive trauma, uh, lost a limb, uh, uh, but mostly brain trauma, Th- things things that cause uh, lots of memory loss, like personality loss. He wanted to restore someone to their original personality from these these brain injuries and so he became obsessed with this 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 quest to do this and was able to do some functionality being able to restore say motor functionality to somebody who was paralyzed because of a brain injury but and and even um managed to uh they've actually changed this i didn't realize this um it so so originally they this was been been updated so this is brand new news to me um in the early this is all in the the 30th century so in the early 2900s he he was doing this process and was able to fully restore somebody based off of what were effectively brain scans uh, ct scans more more extensive that he was able to scan someone before they got injured and then when they had a brain injury, he was able to use those scans to completely restore functionality for motor functionality, which is a huge step of, of like restoring the ability to walk and talk and see and all those sorts of things, smell, to, to restore all of that. But it did not restore the personality of that person. They were still changed because of their, 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 uh, their incidents. So originally, this was set in 2947. They retconned it. I just realized they retconned it and didn't tell anybody. <laughs> but um, in 2932, the uh, Ibra- uh, Dr. Ibrahim was um, was invited to discuss a captured or, or to investigate a captured piece of technology 
because that program that he was using to scan brain, to do brain scans was sponsored by the military. The military is very interested in trying to restore people back to their original selves and, you know, functionality and such. So the UAE government invited uh, Dr. Ibrahim to study captured Van Duel scanning technology. Now, this was more advanced than anything humans had and more than anything that they'd ever seen the Van Duel have. And so Dr. Ibrahim formed a team and were barely able to deconstruct. Like they were looking at it like, I have no idea what this is. Like we know it's a scanner. That's all we know. Um, so, oh, they, they didn't change it. So this is, this is the case. Okay. My bad. I, I thought I was, I thought they'd captured. They captured it in 2932, but it was like salvage. It was a piece of the whole, but uh, so they were able to understand a little bit of it, but they weren't able to deconstruct it and understand its workings too well. But in a covert naval operation in 2946, hint, hint, nudge, nudge, say no more, kind of like, oh yeah, it's CIG, let's let's figure out what the story of Squadron 42 Part 2 or Part 3 is going to be about. Uh, but uh, 2946, the new military intelligence allowed... Dr. Ibrahim to unlock the full technology, uh, full potential of the technology. He realized it wasn't a scanner in the traditional sense. It scanned everything. It scanned not only your physiological, like your, 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 how you function, but your brain functions, your brain patterns. It was able to discuss, to figure out how your neural pathways were working. And so he used this technology and reverse engineered it to create what's become known as the Ibrahim sphere, which is a scanning technology, which can completely scan the whole person, personality, memories, everything. And found, uh, it wasn't just, just DNA. It was everything and found a weird thing that happens, which is when you scan someone with this Ibrahim sphere technology, they could step out of the room. They could get on a ship. They could fly to four systems away. And the Ibrahim sphere would still update all of the information that that person was experiencing through a link, which is similar to quantum entanglement through interspace. So it's near instantaneous communication between both of these, the scan and the living person. While this was great, Problem was, if someone got injured, say they got hurt or they had traumatic brain injury, the scan would then update for that traumatic brain injury. So you couldn't, in theory, bring someone back whole if they had um, had had a case of these severe, severe changes to them. So if you say, for instance, we're in a battle, you got a scar across your face. When you regen, your or when you, when you um, well, uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. But that that scar would remain no matter what. It would be a, a, it would it, that would be imprinted on your imprint. That would change your makeup of what you are. If you lost an arm, your arm would be gone. Like it would the the, the update the data would update for a missing arm. And you could reprint and that kind of stuff. And it would there's some some drift aspects where like the longer you take uh, to read to imprint, it doesn't it's not as clear. So these imprints will uh, are, require constant updates to kind of see it. But there was really no nothing other than just saying these things exist. Uh, these were t- termed traumatic response echoes. Uh, so these echoes would build up in these imprints over time. However, Biotacorp developed something that they call regen serum. And here's the thing in the lore, it just comes out of nowhere. It's just, here's regen serum. There's no information on what it is, how it functions, where it came from, who developed it. So my theory is at least it's a part of project um, uh, Calliope specifically to, as that, that kind of generation process to change somebody's appearance can also be used to like regrow limbs and of obviously an entire person. So in 2949, the first successful regeneration occurred where they would take a person's imprint because once they died, their imprint would remain. You could still keep their personality stored in a device, which leads to some really interesting story aspects I hadn't thought about until now. 
Could you save someone's imprint and not regen them and keep them there forever and then regen them later? To try to, like, as a cryogenic stasis? Almost which, like uh, storing someone in the, uh, the, the pattern buffer for... Yeah. Uh, in Star Trek, you know. Yeah. Uh, we know it breaks down it, over time, but, you know. Mm-hmm. Because that's a, an interesting thought of like, um, you know, for for inmates, because we know yeah. that if you, you know, it, it, essentially, if you it, they, they want you to capture somebody, because if if you if you kill a bounty, then they will, you know, if they have an imprint somewhere, they'll regen somewhere and they'll still be free. Um, mm-hmm. And so it's not as effective. But if um, you capture them and bring them in, you know, essentially. You know, we, we've speculated on this, like, do they, you know, when you go to Klesher or probably not even Klesher, maybe even um, quarter deck, what have you, uh, the Justice Star satellite, you know, if you do they force, you know, inmates to imprint there. So that way, if they die while they're in prison, if they die while they're in quarter deck because you got shanked, you just regen there and you're still stuck in prison. You know, you can't commit suicide to, to get your way out. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, is that also um, moving on to the dystopian uh, future? Does part of your contract with um, Hurston, say with Hurston dynamics, you know, in order to, uh, you know, sign you, you sign your sign here, you're going to work here for 10 years to work off your debt. Um, and, uh, but it's mandatory, mandatory participation in the Hurston dynamics healthcare program, which includes, you know, uh, imprinting free at one of our, yeah, yeah free, free regen. One, free at one of region. our high, high quality facilities because i'm sure they do they take a lot of care and put a lot of money into making sure that your ivs is maintained at a really high level you know Uh is that something you have to consider you know that okay i'm gonna go work for them but if i die and uh and have to you know in the 10 years that i'm working with them is my ivs score going to drop dramatically because i'm getting imprints done at a a second rate facility you know they say that maria pure of heart is a you know top of the line facility but is it really is it really there is a private wing to the to the hospital that if you you can go find it so Uh, Mm -hmm. but effectively what this does is allow people to come back from the dead um it doesn't because of the traumatic response echoes though it's not an immortality device you can't be functionally immortal no matter what happens, it will happen to you. Uh, it'll just bring you back to where you were uh, the last time you imprinted. Um, and, you know, with, with additions changed on what's, what's, what's going on. Uh, now, th- does that mean that you, if you lose an arm, you lose your arm? Not necessarily. Um, because the, as far as we can tell, because it's still very, uh, very early days, because one of the things that always came up in my brain was, well, what if I got decapitated? Am I going to regen without a head? Because that's new update to my body structure. Um, and I think the answer is with some wibbly wobbly storytelling device stuff is that it, it probably has a status quo symbol, which would also be the reason why the IVS score, like there's an IVS score, which eventually goes, you no. Know, um, but effectively when you we're kept jumping all over the place for this one, but um, effectively when you come back to life, you are set at a, a, base level that you were as best as the the machine can do for you where you're effectively 3d printed they take the regen gel and they kind of grow a new person from that gel you don't have like a set of clones that you just pull from that you just download your consciousness into no they build the body from scratch for you then then download your information into your your body so you just kind of wake up after being dead uh, and depending on how long you've imprinted, what's the the quality of the imprint, how far away you were from the imprint will affect things like your memory, uh, will affect things like your score, which they have these because of these traumatic response echoes. As these traumatic response echoes build up, the less perfect re- regeneration is going to be. So if you lost an arm, you, um, you know, in, in a, conflict and you have a low ivs score when you regen there may not be enough there may be too much errors built up in the uh in the scans that your you, they just cannot re- regen your arm you know it just doesn't exist anymore because it's just like nope that's that's the latest update we can we can we can put together we're going to remove this person's arm so you have to get a replacement either by growing or biotics um bionics and that kind of stuff so 
uh, it, it has some aspects, uh, some, some limitations to it, but it does allow for things like industrial accidents, uh, military combat to not be fatal mistakes. You can, you know, you, you fall off a le ledge and get burned to death inside of a, like a, like a melting molten metal furnace. Well, <laughs> you're back, back, back to work the next day, probably, or possibly. So it's a, you know. I always uh, think that this is the reason why there's no OSHA regulations because they don't need to anymore because everything's fine. <laughs> you don't need handrails. That person will be back to work tomorrow if they fall off. They're just stupid, you know. Um, but it, this isn't without controversy because there is a there is a bunch of people who effectively call this what it kind of is, which is a soul capture device. Um, so a lot of religious groups are a file uh, are, are against it. Uh, many economists are worried about it because this will extend life uh, expectancy for the average person because once it got out that this was working, um, in her infinite wisdom, the new imperator, um, Leilani Addison, who is all about new technology, made it free. So if you had the materials to make Regen Serum and if you have the technology to build an Ibrahim Sphere, you can create yourself a regen device, no matter who you are, no matter where, as long as you have that access to the information. It's like open source re respawn is what it is. And this means a couple of other complicated aspects because now criminals can do things. We've actually seen this in multiple times uh, where they ghost themselves in the middle of if they're going to get caught, they'll turn the gun on themselves so they don't get caught because they know they're going to regen back at where they they last they last imprinted so they can get away from the, from the police. Uh, so if you go out for a bounty hunting, it's like, oh, dead or alive. I can bring you in uh, warm or I can bring you in cold. In, 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 unfortunately, in, in the Star Citizen universe, it's not as like tense because the, the bounty target just go, okay. And then they'll be back on the, 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 the start of the next, you know, the next day they'll be back doing their criminal aspects and you get basically nothing. You haven't stopped anything, but you know, maybe got some like biological stuff. So the biological uh, uh, material out of it. So the, this kind of leads into the more dystopian parts of Star Citizen, because if you really think about the aspects of regen, it's amazing concept. It's fairly unique. I don't know many other story, story uh, storytelling devices that try to use this sort of thing. And CHG's really leaned into it about the, the complicated, the legal aspects of where you use the same person, the philosophical, you know, philosophical aspects of that, the, all of these sorts of aspects, which have been only, only been around for about a year. So like Regen's only been around for about two, three years now in, in the Star Citizen universe. And it's already opening up lots of Pandora's boxes when it comes to what is, how do you do this? Uh, but it also means that people who have like, low IVS scores, you, 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 uh, you have blessed technology. You may be living in the frontier or in the poor areas when you, you know, you, you have a higher chance of losing your life. You come back. Now you have a cheap knockoff arm versus, you know, some rich person dies in a shuttle accident. They're perfect the next day. So it, it's, it's very cyberpunk. It actually dives more into the cyberpunk aspect of, of the universe with regeneration. Um, you were also going to tell us a little bit more about Brentworth as well. I'll be right back. Sure. Uh, before I go into the Brentworth thing, I also wanted to mention two things that I thought were interesting in the, the regen bit is uh, they have a couple of terms listed in uh, as terminology that's used within the universe. One of them is white. And so it says, uh, this is the term used to express when someone's IVS is low enough that they can no longer be regenerated. So it's something I need to take into context is if you don't maintain your imprint viability score um, by getting frequent imprints or by having to be regened too often, or you're using a imprint scanner that's of lower quality, your IVS score will continue to go down. So you know maybe you'll start off at 100 and you know certain things will make it go down further and further over time. Uh, in terms of those factors. Um, the term originates from a reference to an imprint being permanently wiped from an Ibrahim sphere. So th that could be a thing in the Star Citizen universe where someone could um, could remove your imprint 
without mm-hmm. you knowing about it. You know, that, that imprint could be deleted. Somebody could, you know, go on there and, and delete your imprint. And if you don't have an imprint, when you die, you die. Mm-hmm. But outlaws will sometimes refer to wiping someone, uh, to wiping someone out as killing them in a manner that will stop them from regenerating. Also can be referred to as ghosting. And so this suggests that um, because of traumatic response echoes, depending on how you die, if the way that you die is so traumatic, it is so um, so awful that you your imprint viability score because of that trauma, traumatic response, ec- those echoes might make it that you can't even be regen. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they they basically you know create a person without a, a functioning you know, psyche and, and brain, you know, because of the 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 trauma that you've um, endured. And so I think that this could be one of those things where, you know, you are, you know, and that this, you know, that horrific dystopian universe where if you're tortured by criminals or, or slavers for a really long time and, you know, you're, or you're uh, prevented from, you know, imprinting for a long time because you're uh, captured by criminals and, and you know, uh, having, you know, you're a slave or whatever, um, it could make it so that way you, you don't reach it. Your imprint yeah. viability score goes down. Uh, yeah, over over that period, or or because of what you have been subjected to, that you can't regen, they can't regenerate you, um, and so that's a, an interesting concept. And the other thing, and this is a a detail that gets often overlooked, um, is that with the with what Imperator Addison did, and this is one of those things that's sort of contentious within the the whole regen story, is she made it so that um, the Technology is. She wanted to make it as widely available as possible, so she made it so that the specifications for the Ibrahim sphere, um, so multiple companies could produce the scanners and bioprinters needed. So there are multiple companies making the Ibrahim spheres and the, the the scanners that make it so that way you can create an imprint, because the sphere is where it is stored. The imprint is stored, but then you need a scanner that makes it so that way you can make that imprint and store it on on the sphere. But you mm-hmm. also need the bioprinters, which is what Bioticor makes in order to regenerate someone from an imprint that's stored on the Ibrahim sphere. So, um, but at the end, what it says, you know, while regeneration is still costly because essentially the regen serum, whatever they use to bioprint you from Bioticor, you know, it's probably very complex and prohibitively costly to make. Um, it says even the lowliest space station is equipped with an imprint capable medical scanner. Um, and so you will have scanner devices all over the place, mm-hmm. but where you are able to regen at is more limited because it says that the scanners are widely available and those are all over the place. It's essentially uh, kind of like what we have today where even a, your small rural hospital in, you know, tiny town, uh, West Texas has a cat scanner. Mm-hmm. Um, they can't do anything with it because they don't have a radiologist there. But what they can do is they can scan you and that scan will go to somebody who, you know, a radiologist somewhere else who reads it and sends back the interpretation. Well, it's essentially the same thing with imprinting. They, you can get a scan done in order to maintain your imprint viability score in someplace, um, someplace rural, you know, a, a station, you know, way out in the middle of nowhere. You know, you can still get that scan done, you know, to maintain your IVS, to make sure that you don't drift too far away from your imprint. Um, but you might not be able to regen anywhere nearby. Um, so it's really, you know, it sets the tone for making it very important to make sure you stop off at these stations or hospitals to make sure that you're updating your scan. But it still puts, you know, r- retains the consequence of not only are you liable to have traumatic response echoes that could make it so that way, you know, you'll be able to, re, you know, regenerate with uh, new legs and new arms. Um, but those echoes might make it so that way you essentially have a debuff to those arms or legs or to your lungs or, or organs that make it so you can't function as well as you would have otherwise. Or you might need to go through more rehabilitation um, in, in order to get back to where you were beforehand. But also, you know, you need to make sure that you're also maintaining your imprint so that way you can actually uh, regenerate um, and, and not be essentially wiped. Um, but yeah, moving on from that. And I thought it was really interesting because the this next lore piece about the Brentworth Care Center, which is the name of the hospital on Microtech, um, it's actually a chain of hospitals. But the the lore surrounding Brentworth Care Center really ties into uh, the lore regarding regeneration and the lore surrounding Bioticor, um, in that 
there are, you know, that there are, are financial consequences as well as logistical and operational consequences to um, how you maintain, you know, your your health for your your character in Star Citizen and how NPCs are are treated and what the the universe is actually like. Because we've gone back and forth um, talking about how Star Citizen, the universe itself, is a, a dystopia, and that's one thing that's really interesting to me is the uh, the narrative team. Uh, with the design documents for the gameplay elements, as well as the lore elements that we've talked about, they've created a medical and a healthcare system within Star Citizen that is both advanced and futuristic, but it also um, it, it very much mirrors much of what we have today, but in a more futuristic way. Uh, this includes the uh, the challenges associated with medical logistics. You know the the disparities between first world medicine, you know, what's available in the first world and third world healthcare. Um, you know, like we talked about with what's available um, on Corel and the city of New Junction, where these uh, colonies and, and planets in uh, less affluent parts of the UEE don't have the same uh, medical care that available to them uh, compared to maybe what's available on Terra or on Seoul. Um, and there's also a lot of difference between uh, what medical care is available to the haves and the have-nots. Are you, you know, basically an indentured servant to the um, to the Hurston Dynamics, and you only have what's available at Mar Maria Pure of Heart, or do you have Brentworth Care Center available to you because you work for Microtech, or are you um, on uh, New Junction in uh, on the planet Corel, and you've got the public healthcare system of Empire Health Services available to you. And what they'll do for you is really based off of the the sort of cost benefit analysis that the UEE goes through. Um, do you join the military to have more medicine available to you, um, and what's available you know within the military? And um, are you getting great healthcare, but at the risk of being a guinea pig? Uh, mm -hmm. So there's a, a lot of really interesting themes that are basically laid out very basically in these um, design in these lore documents as well as the gameplay design the gameplay design documents, but also with the little hints here and there that we have in other things. Um, and it also does a really good job of uh, of supplementing the importance of medevac medical evacuation and EMS within the Star Citizen universe. You know, there's an entire if you go to the uh, Apollo com link for the, uh, Apollo's release. It talks about there's a whole movie series um, uh, about um, uh, surrounding the the Apollo. You know, it's a 200 year old ship, but it talks about how the the, the challenges of medical evacuation. And, you know, being a paramedic. You know, or, or and working in EMS in the Star Citizen universe, and and what goes into that. You know, one of the movies is basically themed around the fall of Caliban. Mm -hmm. You know, when the Vandal are invading and they're trying to evacuate everybody. It's, it's a really cool theme um but the the sort of uh last uh, third major lore document is uh again it's a portfolio um, and there's a lot of portfolios about there but they're you know the the two major portfolios surrounding medicine and healthcare and and health uh, uh, in star citizen is the the portfolio on the brentworth care center and um like i mentioned the brentworth care center is the name of the hospital on microtech and we are we're sort of you know, what we get in game is a very small glimpse into what's available health and healthcare medicine wise compared to what we have in lore. Paul, like what you always say is the the bulk of the lore is not in game at all. You have to go no. looking for it. But we have the four hospitals in Stanton, um, you know, Maria Pure of Heart, which is very much a corporate health system by Hurston Dynamics. And so you can, you know, guess how good that is, you know. And do you go to the the general patient wing because you're you know poor and you're an indentured servant there, or are you a Hurston executive and you go to the the VIP wing? Um, you have Orison General, which is uh, more of a middle of the road uh, healthcare system, you know, because it's provided by um, Crusader, you know, and they, they want to take pretty good care of their employees, but you don't get the best of the best like you have at Brentworth. And then Area 18. Used to be, I think it's called the Area 18 Clinic or Medical Clinic, mm -hmm. but now it's a Empire Health Services uh, hospital. And you know, we don't have hard confirmation, but the the other mention that we have of Empire Health Services uh, alludes to it being more of a, a public healthcare system. And 
you know, essentially it sounds like um, ArcCore has essentially contracted out with the UEE to provide a Empire Health Services, you know, hospital and healthcare system on their planet to all their employees and the employees of the other companies on ArcCore. But um, Brentworth uh, starts out, um, it, it's mentioned in, in that it's, you know, consistently ranked as the, you know, among the top healthcare providers in the UE for both uh, patient health, customer happiness, but also uh, the top in terms of cost. You know, the what you get, you, know, you get what you pay for when it comes to healthcare and medicine and star citizen. Um, and the best of the best comes out of Brentworth Healthcare Centers. Um, to the point where, you know, people swear by the services provided by Brentworth, but insurance companies are basically getting to the point where they're almost rejecting claims because of the high cost of ins- uh, of service. And um, I think this is an interesting theme because it suggests that, you know, okay, you know, you can pay out of pocket um, in order to cover these services, but your insurance might not pay, uh, depending on what health insurance you have in game. Hooray, welcome to America if you're not from here. Um, mm-hmm. But it might pay more or less of what the cost of it is. And so like we were talking about, Paul was mentioning the how you can basically have these um, via you know regen serum and what biotacore does you know you can have these cosmetic services to alter your appearance it's gonna cost you because you know your insurance might say okay this isn't medically necessary so uh we're gonna pay this much and you have to pay this much out of pocket so you might have to save up in game in order to be able to afford these things um you also you know if you choose to you know have your your imprint saved at a brentworth care center um, it might be, cost you more money. It might cost you more out of pocket based off what your insurance covers in order to have that, um, to be able to uh, recover at a, a better rate compared to what you might get reprint, uh, imprinting and regening somewhere else, you know, with uh, less of an impact from those traumatic response echoes. Because uh, it, it talks more about that theme in, in the article itself. And it'll make a lot more sense here in a second. Um, but the founder of Brentworth Care Center, um, his name was Jaleel Brentworth, you know, na- named it after himself. And he was born on Earth in 2829. Um, and he was a, a very privileged child, um, came from a family with a lot of money. Um, but his older brother, Sajit, uh, was diagnosed with a rare liver disease. And um, he, Jaleel watched his brother suffer through uh, multiple experimental treatments um, to try and you know, cure the, the disease before getting an artificial liver. Um, and so essentially, you know, this is prior to the idea of having, you know, uh, what we talked about with potentially having um, organs and limbs grown using the regen serum in order to make them um, function more appropriately, have less chance of rejection. And so um, Sajit, Jaleel's brother, had the um, uh, an artificial liver implanted um, and it basically restored Sajit to, to health. But over time, his body uh, started to slowly reject that new liver. And I, I think that does a really good job of you know, playing into that theme of, you know, OK, you can, you know, you can if you've got the money and you've got the means, you can, you know, nowadays you can have a, a regen grown liver uh, in order to and have that implanted in you. And you'll have far less chance of it being rejected and, you know, it'll, it'll work a whole lot better for you. Or you can have a, um, a, a artificial one put in. And there's a chance that it won't work and there's a chance that it won't function as well. And it might have this debuff associated with your character. Um, it's an interesting way of leaving these things open for the gameplay designers based off of what you prioritize for your character in game. And so, um, uh, Jaleel, uh, because of, uh, the, the, the condition that his brother went through and the, the amount that he suffered in, um, his brother eventually died. And that's what, inspired Jaleel to go into uh, go on to study medicine. And so he he didn't uh, go to, uh, interesting enough, he didn't go to university in Red Ore. Um, he went to the University of Earth at Australia. Um, and he really, because of um, what was going on with his brother, he be, you know became very interested in the nervous system um, because essentially the nervous system was what was rejecting um, that implanted uh, uh, artificial liver uh, in his brother. And became fa- fascinated with axons, the, the nerve si- uh, fibers that conduct electrical impulses, you know, to your organs and to your your, your muscles and other tissues. Um, and he wrote a bunch of research papers while he was going through school, 
um, about the potential for uh, improving the way in which cybernetic implants and artificial organs um, are able to communicate and uh, uh, connect with the body. So that way, um, he wanted to make it so that way you could reduce the the rate that these things either uh, were rejected, um, but also improve the way in which they functioned. So that way, people could you know survive and go on to live you know uh, better lives. Unlike his brother. Um, and his work actually caught the attention of a researcher at the university um, that he was studying at, um, Dr. Ariel Rue, or R-O-U-X. Um, and that researcher was uh, studying ways to reverse nerve degeneration. Um, and so, you know, essentially, we've got another instance where these two scientists, you know, researchers come together. They research, you know, realize that their work is linked. You know, okay, let's come together and how do we how do we take this to the next level? In order to to get the get the results that we are looking for, but this is much earlier than what was occurring with Biotacor. You know, certainly mm-hmm. probably fifty plus years uh, comparatively. Um, yeah, this is probably like twenty eight forties, twenty eight fifties. So mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, not not because uh, Biotacor was really you know started out in like twenty nine tens. You know, a, lot, yeah. a, a good deal later. Um, but yeah, Doctor Ariel Aru was uh, studying ways to reverse nerve degeneration, which is a big cause that led to implant failure. Um, and they say, so they went to, um, they went on to do simulated trials for the, to, to use these methods that Jaleel Brentworth uh, had proposed in his papers in order to reverse the nerve degeneration that Dr. Ariel Rue was researching. And so um, the, the, these initial, um, pardon me, uh, simulated trials showed a lot of promise and they were doing this before Dr. Brent, before Jaleel Brentworth had even received his doctorate. Like he was still in school and they were already doing this, which is really impressive. Um, and so as soon as he received his doctorate, uh, instead of going into private practice, he joined up with um, Dr. Rue's research team at the UE, uh, University of Earth uh, at Australia as a surgical specialist. So he didn't go into private practice. He went straight into research which is again, really impressive because normally you have to go into practice, practice medicine for a long time uh, and, and go on to do, you know, uh, publish papers and do a whole bunch of postdoctoral, you know, things before you get invited to go do research at, you know, universities and institutes. Um, you basically have to make a name for yourself and then you get invited. And he got invited to do this before it even finished school. So yeah, it was basically a prodigy. And um, so um, they, they, Finally, um, uh, what they did is they, they, they did a whole a bunch of these trials, uh, simulations, in order to try and prove out their theories you know, that they had been working on in order to uh, get the results they were looking for. But they weren't getting the progress that they, that they wanted. And um, what they noticed, though, uh, later on, is that uh, during some of their trials, uh, some of the participants in their trials were doing better um, uh, when they had their surgeries uh, on ships uh, with artificial or, or low gravity. And this, this realization sort of created a rift between um, now Dr. Jaleel Brentworth and Dr. Ariel Rue, and that Dr. Ariel Rue thought that the, um, the major thing was the, the low gravity, that by doing these uh, surgeries and, and procedures in lower or artificial gravity, that that was the, the link to the better outcome that they're looking for. And Dr. Brentworth um, noticed that the, when patients were having these surgeries, you know, on uh, space stations and, and on ships, um, you know, with artificial gravity, um, it was, he noticed that the, a big difference was that the environment that was, that these were occurring in was uh, more of a luxury environment. These were uh, being done on really nice ships. So you can imagine like a, a, a origin 890 hospital ship um, is where the surgery is occurring. And he noticed that, you know, a higher propensity of these patients that were having the outcome that he's looking for, were having them in these really high quality, almost resort like um, hotel environments. By the I mean, way, that's what he attributed to. By the way, when we say 890, that was just a reference. There is no lore of an 890 yeah. hospital <laughs> ship. We'd love to see it, but it's yeah. no lore for yeah. it. So it yeah. could be a thing. It's not a thing yet. You know? Yes. Uh, but you know, that's uh, sort of to get the, uh, the feel for, you know, what, uh, what yeah. they're talking about as far as the, the environment that the, uh, these people who are having the, 
the positive outcomes calming yeah. atmospheric noises like like mm -hmm. bubbling brooks like feng shui very 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 calming colors that kind of thing it's yeah. it's very what sort of incense would you like us to burn during yeah. your procedure you know yeah, all that exactly. sort of stuff yeah mm -hmm. um and so it, it, and this kind of continues in that theme of the haves and have nots so the the two doctors they actually sort of separated amicably and they continued their research, you know, on what they thought was the, the link to, um, the, the improvements and outcomes. And, um, but, uh, so Dr. Brentworth went on to perform his, his, his next set of surgeries, his procedures in standard gravity con uh, conditions, but within low, uh, within resort quality rooms and resort quality operating theaters, both, uh, for, for patients to relax in both pre and post-op, you know, before the procedure and after the procedure. Um, and uh, so that's where they, 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 had, they, they sort of amicably separated. And then Dr. Brentworth went back to his parents and said, Hey, I've got a theory and I think I'm going to get the results that I want, but I need money. And so his parents basically gave him all the money he needed in order to start up uh, a hospital. That's how rich, you know, Jaleel's family, uh, Dr. Jaleel Brentworth's family was. Um, and um, so he, uh, he basically got this massive investment from his family to open up the very first Brentworth Care Center. Uh, and he, um, the, the core tenet of this hospital was that the comfort and the care received throughout the treatment, you know, from the minute you're admitted, the minute you walk in the door, you know, even if you get picked up, to the minute you get discharged was second to none. And he hired um, a design firm, you know, a, a UE famous design firm to design his hospital, you know, so that everything about the hospital, the the aesthetic, the sounds, you know, the, you know, everything down to the, the plants that were in the, the lobby and the hotel rooms, you know, the music played, um, everything was, you know, uh, no expense was spared. And uh, Dr. Brentworth, um, you know, he, he had some early success, but he, again, got his, um, just like with Bioticor, he, he really sort of had his breakthrough when a, um, a, a, a member of the, uh, security team for one of the, uh, one of the, uh, UE Senate, um, had a procedure done to correct a, an issue that had been ongoing with a, cy a cybernetic leg, you know, essentially, you know, he had had, the cybernetic leg implanted and it wasn't working right. You know, just a common theme that we've been talking about where, you know, the, the, because of the care he received, it wasn't working right. You know, and it was essentially probably preventing this uh, security personnel from doing their job appropriate, you know, to their best of their ability. And so Dr. Brentworth convinced um, this security person to, Hey, come have the procedure at my facility you know, you'll get the best care available. And instead of having all these complex, you know, invasive procedures, we'll do it with one small procedure and you'll recover, you know, in, in like a resort like experience. And I guarantee you'll be night and day better. And so he had a, uh, the security staffer just basically had the, the best experience and was essentially cured. Um, and he went on to tell everybody at the Senate that, Hey, this Dr. Brentworth, you know, is legit. He's the real deal. It's the best care you're ever going to experience. Instead of having all these multiple surgeries, I just had one little procedure. I felt a million times better and look at me now. And he's running down the Senate hall, you know, demonstrating mm -hmm. how his cybernetic leg works. And he went on to treat a number of uh, members of the Senate. Word continued to get out, you know, via the, the Senate connections, you know, to, you know, you know the, the rich and the famous that a hey, Dr. Brentworth runs the best hospital in the UEE, you know, and whatever you need done, you want to go there because he's going to get it done right the first time. You'll feel so much better. You know, you're not going to have all these issues that are notorious, you know, throughout the rest of the UEE. And so that's how the brand just absolutely exploded um, to the point where the first Brentworth Care Center was just booked, booked out months in advance. And because it was booked out so far in advance, he had people uh, scheduling uh, investors scheduling elective surgeries out months in advance, you know, delaying their care just so they could go in and see him to, you know, put in a pitch to be like, Hey, let me invest in your company. I want to help you build more hospitals. You know? And he's like, really, you know, you're, you're here for surgery. And we're like, well, actually before we do that, you know, I really <laughs> wanted to say, you know, I, I really came down here because I wanted to invest in your company. 
And uh, so Dr. Brent would. Go I was going to say, another thing that's important about when you're reading this is that a lot of this, because this is a new one. The Brentworth Medical Center was came out very recently, last year or two, this, this mm-hmm. lore. Um, there are multiple mentions of like senators who had horrible burn scars, uh, Senate security with, uh, bio, uh, you know, um, bionics, um, um, uh, uh, like limbs and augmentations. So like, this is another way of saying like, it's really common to get hurt in the citizen universe. Space is mm-hmm. dangerous and people will get hurt all the time. Even the most wealthy and, and rich. So it's not un- uncommon to see like people with reconstruction surgery or, or, or artificial limbs or different, you know, that sort of things. It's just, that's another kind of thing to point in there is that, yeah, this is very common, uh, the super common oh, yeah. kind of occurrence. So. Yeah, we don't see it in game, but we've seen the concept art for the, the bionic limbs and stuff like that. And they've talked about how, you know, characters will have scars and everything because, you know, you, you know, you can have that limb replaced. You can get a new limb grown, um, but there's a chance that it won't work. There's a chance that it might not work as well as the, the previous limb, um, you know, and if you want to have the best of the best, it's going to cost you. And that's where the, the Brentwood Care Center stuff comes from. Um, because it, he, Dr. Jaleel didn't want to expand. He didn't, you know, he, he didn't want to retain, you know, lose control over the quality of the care because he thought that, you know, it would dilute the brand. It wouldn't be as good, you know, by letting someone else do it. And eventually, you know, he was a micromanager and it's like, Oh, where in star citizen have we heard about a micromanager who is, you know, absolutely always looking over everyone's shoulders to do stuff. You know, hmm, who, who, who does that in the star citizen universe? Yeah. You know, yeah. Or development. Um, but uh, he eventually uh, decided to do it his own. Instead of taking on investors, he took the money and the profits that he made in order to build more hospitals. So that way he could, you know, for each one that he built, um, he uh, supervised, you know, to the last detail how it was constructed in order to make sure that nothing was uh Nothing was left up to chance. You know, the the construction, you know, who was hired, how are they trained? You know, he wanted to make sure, you know, that, you know, each hospital lived up to the standard of the original. And uh, eventually, um, you know, he continued to reinvest his profits into making more and more hospitals, but to make sure that, you know, the, the standard of care never diminished, no matter, you know, where it was opened um, or who ended up working there, you know, to, to make sure that it was uh, cohesive. Um, and to the point where, you know, there are lots of Brentworth care centers across the empire. Um, and there've been other hospitals that have tried to replicate it, but it never have been able to, you know, match their success. So like, if you look at origin general, like it's a nice looking hospital, you know, um, there's a, you know, it's, you know, very clean and everything, but it's not Brentworth. Um, but ironically enough, um, Dr. Brentworth died at a relatively young age and they say relatively young age of 87, you know, Mm -hmm. which is pretty old nowadays. Um, But his partner revealed posthumously that he had chronic kidney disease and he had uh, Dr. Jaleel Brentworth decided not to have a artificial kidney um, because, you know, in 2917, you know, he retired, died shortly thereafter. So this is before the whole regen thing. Um, before he could have had a new kidney grown for him because they had all the means, you know, he, you could still die from kidney disease because you could have an, one implanted, um, an artificial one, you know, and, you know, the, if you had the best care, you know, there's a good chance that it would work and it would, you know, be, you know, nearly as good. Um, but he decided against having an artificial replacement uh, because he, you know, jokingly said he didn't trust anyone the, with the procedure but himself. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, he's like, nah, I, I don't want anyone to do, else to do this. And I'm just going to, you know, live out my life naturally because I don't want anyone else to cut up on me because no one else is as good. Um, and, um, you know, it, even though his name has faded from public consciousness because it's been decades since he's died, you know, the the standards of Brentwood Care Center have have remained high. And that's why, you know, if you go, you know, if, if you're a player in Star Citizen, you know, it, it matters where you choose to have your, uh, your, your healthcare done, you know, it, it's going to have an impact. Um, you know, you could choose to go to a endeavor with a tier one med bed, um, and to get healed from your tier one injury, but that healing might have a longer debuff, you know, a longer recovery phase than if you decided to go back to a, you know, civ- you know, civilized system and go to a Brentwood care center 
or if you're in Stanton and you're injured and you decide to get healed up at, you know, Maria pure of heart, you might have, you know, that, that injury, you know, the effects of that injury linger with you for a longer period of time than if you went to Brentworth. But if you go to Brentworth, it's going to cost you, you know, it, it may cost you more out of pocket, you know, your insurance might not cover it. You know, there may be things that are offered at Brentworth that aren't offered at Maria pure of heart, you know, services like the reconstruction that Paul talked about. It might not be, we don't know for certain, but these, these lore pieces lay out the, the differences in that star citizen dystopia between the haves and the haves nots between first world and third world medicine between what you might have available to you from the public healthcare system of empire health versus the private healthcare systems, you know, which vary considerably as well. Yeah. I was going to say it, it, it's very much uh, like the way the lore lays out, I think more than any other aspect, because we already do have some of these aspects in game, the lore spells out the gameplay in such concrete fashions that you can see the through line of not just the lore writers, but the developers and designers and how they're planning on do things. So for instance, convalescence time, as I've talked about before, and, uh, and, you know, you kind of mentioned looking at kind of a debuff thing as something where there's going to be something that's going, going wrong. Uh, things like the differences between regrowing limbs. If you say your IBS score is too low, you get a new limb, which is just your arm, but you know, a cloned arm of your old, old arm effectively, or do you get an, a cybernetic uh, or a, a bionic extension? You know, there's, I think there's some differences between cybernetic and bionic. I think bionic is more like metal, but designed to look more natural. And, and cybernetic is more just, I don't care. Big metal arm go burr. But um <laughs> That'll also be another thing, because I know a lot of people, I know there's probably a couple people who clicked on this video <laughs> who are listening to this on a podcast in the podcast format who are like, I really want to have uh, a uh, cybernetic, I want a full cyborg myself. Full, It's like, yeah, it's going to be expensive. That's going to be yeah. real expensive, because unless you go to, the, uh, to like a Brentworth care center, you're not going to be able to keep those parts working. Uh, well, and, uh, you know, the first time you die, you're going to get regent into an old flesh suit and you're gonna have to rebuy all those cybernetics and old flesh re- suit. <laughs> got to rebuy all those, those, those pr- prosthetics and you got to go all the way back mm-hmm. out to the top. So there's going to be definitely some, some aspects to, to, to the game, which are going to flesh out more. And, uh, we've already seen some of these, like, for instance, uh, TC Pacheco, she has cybernetic eyes. Uh, because she lost her eyes in uh, while she was serving with Blackjack for uh, for uh, Black Security for area uh, for Bar Corp, she lost both the use of both of her eyes, so they had to replace uh, place them. I think her arm is also partially cybernetic, and then there's mm-hmm. um, uh, it's hard because I've played so many dystopian games recently that I'm like, yeah, I, I get the images mixed up in my head. But yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's just like in in those sorts of things where you know there's going to be risk reward and cost benefit for choosing how you get your healthcare and and okay maybe this arm is stronger but it doesn't react as quickly as your uh, as a mm-hmm. gro- a new grown arm or maybe you don't have that option because you know if you had a tier two injury on your arm you can have a new grown one when you regen you know, and it's still a, a normal human arm but maybe a tier one injury means you can't get a regrown arm you have to have mm-hmm. a a bio, you know, a cybernetic or biotic, whatever you want to call it. And then you have to choose which make and model you want, you know, or, you know, maybe depending on where you're getting the procedure done, you know, you might have, might not have certain options available to you. It's, it really creates a lot of interesting player choice um, with just a little bit of lore, because there are <laughs> other things that have a lot more lore to it, but they've crammed so much into these pieces. And for me as like, I'm a career medical practitioner. I've worked in every aspect of, you know, as an EMT, through paramedic, critical care paramedic, I've worked in the hospital, on the ambulance. You know, I fly in helicopters all the time. You know, I've done all sorts of stuff. And if you have, you know, more familiarity with how these things sort of work in real life, and then you read these things, you're like, oh, this is how they're solving this problem with lore. This is how they're introducing this with lore. If you tie these two things together, this is, creates an easy way for the narrative team to explain things to allow for the gameplay design teams to, imp, you know, to implement them in the game, you know, to implement, implement these themes. Um, and that actually, one last thing that I wanted to include uh, before you 
keep going is um, a lot of people say, oh, okay, well, we're just going to have a Endeavor Hope class or an Apollo parked nearby and we'll just respawn and regen. And it's like, those things are going to cost a lot of money, you know, because the, the supplies that they use are, are just like today, you know, th that's medical logistics and doing those things costs a lot of money. It's always interesting to me because I scroll through, you know, you, if you have social media like me, my social media is a lot of it is medical related. And that one of the companies that consistently I get ads when scrolling through Facebook um, is a uh, medical evacuation company and they provide insurance. You, you buy their insurance and then they use the insurance payments from their insurance um, or, or uh, to as a supplement to your own insurance in order to use their rescue services um, around the world you know, in order to bring you back to the first world to have a procedure done. They keep you alive, take care of your injury. And one of the things that's really entertaining in the comments on their ads that come up on my Facebook is that people get upset because um, their insurance wouldn't cover the expense of having medical extraction done for this or that thing. And it's like, well, you can see in the comments based off their comment, yeah, they're not going to cover the expense because you're not severely injured enough where you needed that helicopter to fly you off of, you know, the, the Himalayas, you know, yeah. because you really weren't that sick, you know, because it's going to cost money. You know, it's, mm -hmm. you know, you're putting a helicopter that can fly up, you know, halfway up Mount Everest to, you know, bring you down off the, the mountain costs a ton of money. And your insurance is going to say no, because, you know, you're doing OK and you were able to walk down by yourself, you know, with a little bit of assistance. It's the same thing in real life. You know, we have all these companies that provide these services. Um, you have organizations you know, within the military that do these things, but they make decisions based off of you know, how cost effective it is to do a thing. And you know, people say, oh, okay, well, I'll just have my Apollo respond. Well, that regen serum is going to cost you a ton of money. It might be you know, tenfold times more expensive to get regen nearby just to try and get back into the action sooner, even though you're still going to have these debuffs when the UE military doesn't even do that. Yeah. You know, the UE military will evacuate you from the battlefield to a, a military hospital where they'll have your procedure done and allow you to recover because it's more cost effective to do that. Um, and that's why it's interesting to me because you have the lore for, you know, in the, uh, the, the comm link for the Apollo, but then one of the only other mentions of a hospital outside the ones we have in game is uh, Port Fairfax, which, mm. um, interestingly enough, was built during the Messer area as a Navy staging point from where they would launch an invasion of Terra if Terra decided to, to separate, you know, uh, secede from the UEE. But after the Messers fell, they converted much of Port Fairfax. It's still a Navy base. But they converted, it, converted a ton of it into a military hospital complex. And it's, so it's this massive military hospital complex where, uh, you know, starmen, soldiers and Marines who have been injured in the conflict with the Van Duel, they go to, ha you know, they go to get, you know, the, their surgical procedures done. They go to get, you know, have convalescence, get healed up. And it's in Goss, which is a mm -hmm. long ways away from the Van Duel front. And so it goes to show you that, you know, it's it's going to you know if the UE military says it's cost prohibitive for us to you know completely heal you on the battlefield or, or near the battlefield uh, on an endeavor or something like that it's more cost effective for us to transport you all the way to Goss to do that it's going to be very expensive for these services to be provided you know if you're fighting pirates in Null uh, or yeah. if you're you know a, a, a military contractor in the Nexus system in that ongoing conflict. You know, okay, yeah, you know, we, I can provide, I can be that paramedic with a tier one bed and a couple of tier two beds on my Apollo, and I can get you heal all, all healed up. You know, in in the Nexus system, um, you know, back to you know back to fighting shape, and you can be back in the fight in you know in, in no time at all. But it's going to cost you a fortune, or you could get transported back to another system and have the medical care done at a hospital where it's going to be a lot, a lot more cost effective for you to do it, but you're out of the action. And these mm -hmm. are the kinds of decisions that are made every day around the world. Like that's my job. This is what I do. And it's part of the game. It's part of the universe of star citizen, you know, and it's gamified, but it's also lorified, you know, mm -hmm. for, for the universe. It's really interesting. Yeah. I was going to say like, that, that's the other thing that it's important to, to mention. It's not just, we talked about before we were talking before we, we did the, the, the start of the podcast was 
uh, like Kirkland brand, you know, the, the Walmart, <laughs> brand, Sam's Club brand regen serum as a, like kind of as a as a joke. But it's more complicated than that as well, because you also have the factors of uh, storage, because right now we know that in fiction, regen serum is something you have to manufacture and then ass- and then put in. It's not something you can build in situ. It's something that is made in a factory and is then shipped out. So you will have a limited amount of regen serum on board any ship you're on. And the question is, do you want to use that regen serum for regrowing someone's arm that is completely dead? Or maybe for somebody who might die? Or would you rather just keep their imprint on your, you know, Apollo and then fly back to a hospital, transfer that imprint to a hospital and then regen that person, then respawn that person. Because, you know, and then the other question is, there's probably going to be a data limit of how many people can be attached to a certain bed at any given time, unless it's at a hospital, which have larger facilities, larger data banks, and those the sorts of things, the, the larger Ibrahim spheres or more Ibrahim spheres so that you can attach your, your imprint to those spheres versus the the maximum two on board an Apollo or mm-hmm. the the, like, maybe a hundred or so on a, like an Apollo hope or in a never hope uh, and the yeah. zero on everything else. So <laughs> it, it, like there is going to be some meaningful changes. And so I think medical is a great example of lore meeting gameplay and gameplay and lore mixing together to create the, the, the game experience of star citizen. Um, mm-hmm. And it's just on the edge. Like we're, it's not quite the uh, appropriate, like it's not quite, not quite ready. I don't think it's not quite the the uh the concrete has been poured, but it hasn't cured yet. You know, yes. like if you step in it, it's still not it's not all the way there yet. The yes. the foundation isn't fully laid. They they've poured the concrete for the foundation, but it isn't all the way done. Yeah. And it's it, like when I think about the the hospital stuff, I think of like how they have supply and demand uh, impacting your 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 times at refineries and your costs at refineries. It's it, you will probably see much the same thing, the same thing with the hospitals and healthcare available and the costs of, you know, the, the EMS, you know, how much it costs to get picked up by what type of ambulance and what services they're offered. And the, when I was doing the, the research before we, uh, uh, when we were planning this out, I was doing a whole bunch of research. And I think one thing that really sets the tone for how in depth medical gameplay and uh, will be and why this is just the like Paula said the, the sort of the tip of the iceberg um the original misc endeavor q a uh the q a part three had three parts um the first question uh on the misc endeavor q a uh with the hope class ship do you see medical as being a complete profession the medical profession is one of the most important occupations within Star Citizen, and it's intended to be one of the larger and more flexible roles. And it goes on, like, goes on for three paragraphs. And the reason it goes on for three paragraphs, and there's even more to it, is because the person who answered that question was Tony Zurevic. Yeah. So if you think about what does Tony Zurevic do anything simple and bare bones? Absolutely no. not. Everything <laughs> okay. is a complex, interwoven system filled with nuance and yeah. So it, I don't think that man knows the word simple. I don't think he, the simple is not in his vocabulary anymore. That man will do any, anything. If it's anything worth doing, it's worth doing in complex as shit. That's what, what Tony yeah. works like. So it takes Tony Zervek four hours to make breakfast. <laughs> you, can't, you can't just scramble an egg. <laughs> it, ha- it has to be restaurant quality or it's trash. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I don't know if it's true or not, but I think that, that'd be a funny rumor to spread. Sorry, Tony. <laughs> um, He's like, no, I, I just like toast. Thanks. <laughs> well, thank you for coming on. Uh, we'll have you come on. I, I want to get more folks to come on to the Lore Citizen podcast to kind of very, very up with some things. Uh, I'm going to drag um, probably you and um, uh, Atira into one of these because uh, one of the one of the future future episodes I want to do is on. Uh, how can we fix the UE army? How could we improve the UE army oh, to make man. it act- actually viable and what an army would actually look like in the 30th century based off of the lore and stuff like that? So, um, apparently, so the, was, if you ask the community, the simple a- answer is mechs, I guess. I mean, that's my answer. That's my answer is big, <laughs> stompy robots. 
But uh, you know, the other things, like, because when I was watching a video earlier on um, the the 40K Lehman Rush from a, done by a tanker, some like a former tanker who talked about what the Lehman Rush um, is in the 40K lore and how and comparing it to modern military tank, main battle tanks. And he was like, it's actually not that far off from modern military battle tanks in terms of, you know, there's some things you have to kind of keep into a mind and it's a little chunkier and a little bigger, but it's not that much different. And it kind of fits in with the whole theme. So um, having having a, a tanker look at the Nova lore and be like, is the Nova, does the Nova make sense? And, you know, compared to modern, because I've sort of seen so many people like, oh, this is garbage. It's terrible. It's not, no, it wouldn't actually exist. And I, 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 after seeing that, I'm like, I don't know. I think the Nova might actually make sense as a main battle tank in the 30th century when you have things like shields, but we'll have to see mm-hmm. that. Uh, but thank you for coming on. And uh, for those of you listening, if you're listening to the podcast, remember to leave a review, uh, a like. That helps us out a lot. If you're watching this on Twitch or uh, Twitch, Twitch on YouTube, um, hit that like, uh, hit the like button. Make sure you subscribe. If you like this content, we, I'm going to try to do this at least once a month, if not more than that. And uh, let, let's let's know your questions and comments down below in the comments section. Uh, make sure you're going to. It's is it Pathfinders on his own or is it still on Nazareth's YouTube? No, the I'm all uh, everything's on my YouTube now. The older episodes, okay. some of them are still on Pat on Nazareth's, but I'm slowly moving them over. Um, but everything new is on my YouTube for Pathfinders, Armchair Admirals, and Generals. Um, I occasionally I'm behind, but I occasionally do my own lore equals gameplay episodes mm-hmm. um, for things like the uh, uh, Galactopedia updates. Cause those are chuck full of really great information. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah. And uh, uh, I got to do my shameless plug. It's the 30th right now, but my first full feature video is releasing on the first. Uh, so nice. happy new year's everyone. It's my first uh, not podcast, not live recorded video. It's a, you know, a full edited thing. So um yeah, I'm looking forward to sharing with you guys. I think you're going to like it. And there's even a mention of uh, our previous Lore Citizen episode in the podcast. So Excellent. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, make sure to go to it's a Tree0311. Uh, uh, it's YouTube.com slash at tree, uh, tree 0311 because the, the, the little at symbols now take you out everywhere. They get little handles. So, mm-hmm. uh, so you can do that and check those out. And yeah, like I say every time, remember, it's Historia and Astro.